Okay, this is a video summary of Chapter 2, Classification of Matter. This is not the second thing we do in this class. We do it, oh, end of the first nine weeks, beginning of the second nine weeks. It sets us up for our chapter on energy, which is our last chapter on physics. It also sets us up for our four chapters of chemistry. So this is a very important fundamental chapter for chapters 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, which we combine in Chapter 9. Chapter introduces us to the periodic table and the idea that the periodic element, uh, table shows us elements. So each of these squares represents an element. For instance, this is the element iron, element boron, element carbon. Really what the students need to know right now is that the symbols for each element begin with a capital letter. If there's only one letter, it's just one capital, B for boron. If there's two letters, the second one is lowercase, so capital A, lowercase l, capital C, lowercase u. We're going to talk a lot more about the periodic table in later chapters, but this is what's important for right now. All right, we started out by talking about everything and categorizing everything into one of two categories, matter and energy. And matter has mass and takes up space. Another way of saying that is that it has density energy doesn't. There isn't anything that has mass that doesn't take up space. There's nothing that takes space that doesn't have mass. Those things go together. All the matter in the universe is broken up into two categories, pure substances and mixtures. Pure substances are broken up into two categories, elements and compounds. Elements are composed of atoms of the same kind. Compounds are composed of molecules of the same kind. We spent quite a bit of time talking about that and practicing that. Uh, we talked about it using the idea of nuts and bolts and washers. Students probably remember that. A bolt represented one element. A nut represented a different element. A washer represented a different element. If you put a bolt and a nut together, you made a molecule. If you put a bolt and a washer and a nut together, you made a different molecule. So when you have a substance, you can ask yourself first off, it is, a pure, is it a pure substance? If not, it's a mixture. Then you ask yourself, is it a compound or an element? And then you can ask what elements are in it. And let's spend a little bit more time on that. Let's give an example. If I see this, capital C, I know that that's an element. It happens to be carbon. Students don't know that yet, but they should know that that's an element. If I have just one of these things, one carbon only, I call it an atom. If I have two of them, I ref refer to it as the element. So one atom of carbon or the element carbon. Now if I see that, I see a uppercase C and lowercase u. That's an element also. Students don't know this yet, but that is copper. So you have one atom of copper, or if you have a bunch of atoms of copper, you would call it the element copper. It's like talking about a person or a crowd. Now you see that, you see two uppercase letters. That means that these are two different elements. That happens to be a carbon, that's an oxygen. Even if the students don't know that, they know that this is two separate elements. Having them next to each other like that without a comma means that they've been bonded together. So this is not any longer an atom. This is two atoms bonded together into a molecule. If you have just one, we call it a molecule. If we have a pile of these, we refer to it as a compound. Student sees this. They know that this is a molecule. A pile of them is a compound. They know it has two different kinds of elements in it. It has hydrogens and oxygens. And they know that it has two hydrogens and one oxygen. They see this. They know that this is also a molecule pile of it would be a compound. They know it has three different kinds of elements in it. It has hydrogens, sulfurs, and oxygens. 
even if they don't know what those stand for, then they can say that it has H's in it and S's in it and O's in it. There's two of the hydrogens, there's four of the oxygens, and one of the sulfurs. One last one here. We have a molecule. It has two kinds of elements in it, the Mg's and the Cl's. There's one of the Mg's and two of the Cl's. This is magnesium chloride. Moving on to section two of the chapter, talked about properties of matter. Physical properties and chemical properties. Physical properties are often easy to see or to use, observe using your senses. It's things like shape, color, odor, lack of color, mass, volume, density. Sometimes you can't directly observe it, you have to measure it, like finding an object's melting point or a boiling point, how strong it is, how hard it is, whether or not it can conduct electricity or conduct heat. What's important about these is understanding that you can test and evaluate these without changing the identity of an object. When I say identity, I mean it's molecular identity. So the molecular identity of water is H2O. The molecular identity of copper is Cu. The molecular identity of magnesium chloride is MgCl2. Physical properties are usually consistent for pure substances, not for mixtures. So you can use them to identify. If you find a substance that's pure, you don't know what it is, you can mark down its color, you can mark down its density, you can mark down its melting point, you can look it up in a book and find out what material it actually is. This is one students are often confused about. The state of matter that a substance is in, is it a solid, a liquid, or a gas, is a physical property. We use the properties of material to tell us what's a good use for them. Uh, if students are interested, we talked about this idea a lot more, if students are interested in different materials and their properties and their uses, is this plastic good for eating off of or is it good for electronics? Is this metal good for building bridges with or not? There's actually a great career in that area. It's called the materials engineering and I would encourage students to look into that. We spent a lot of time talking about the physical property of density. Density is determined by the mass of an object divided by its volume. Mass is measured in kilograms. Volume is measured in either milliliters or cubic centimeters. Students are used to seeing the V stand for velocity, and this equation stands for volume. The units are going to be mass units divided by volume units, so they're either going to be grams per milliliter or they're going to be grams per cubic centimeter. Either of those are acceptable units. A milliliter of water is equal to a cubic centimeter of water, so those two are the same thing. Um, and we've already done a lab on density, so we've done that before. Now they're working on calculations. Uh, two different ways I expect the students to find density. One is by finding the volume by multiplying length times width times height. The other is finding the volume by what's called displacement. So students have a graduated cylinder. They see how much water is in it, they add an object to it, and they see how much water level has gone up. So say you have 20 milliliters of water in a graduated cylinder, and you add a marble, and it goes up to 22 milliliters. Well, from 20 to 22 is 2 milliliters. That means the marble has a volume of 2, liter, two milliliters. Talked about states of matter as physical property. States of matter are liquid, gas, solid, and plasma. And we talked about the names of the changes. We'll talk about this a lot more next chapter. Students should expect to be tested on this particular idea with our energy chapter. When liquid turns to gas, we call that evaporation. Gas turns to a liquid, we call that condensation. Solid to liquid is melting. Liquid to solid is freezing. Solid to gas is called sublimation. A key to understanding physical properties is knowing that when you're observing them, you're not changing the identity of a substance. Okay? By observing a chemical property, you're putting yourself in a situation where you're changing the identity of the substance itself. There are two chemical properties, reactivity and flammability. If I set an object on fire to see if it's flammable, I'm changing the molecules it's made up of, so I'm changing its identity. 
if I throw something in a vat of hydrochloric acid to see if it reacts, then I'm putting it in a situation where I might change its molecular identity. So these are the only two chemical properties. Students should expect a relatively simple matching question about this on the test. They see a property, they should tell me if it's a physical or chemical property. The mistake students usually make is to say that anything that sounds sciencey must be a chemical property. So conducting electricity, ooh, that sounds sciencey, must be a chemical property. Well, when a metal conducts electricity, it doesn't change its molecules. So it is still just a physical property. Uh, melting point, when you melt an object, you don't change its molecules. You just make them farther apart from each other. And by the way, if I say that something is not flammable or it's not reactive, that's also a chemical property. We lastly, we talked about characteristic properties. These are very special, unique properties about a substance that are really useful in identifying a substance. I want to point out that characteristic properties don't change based on the size of the substance. Sulfur is bright yellow and it smells like gunpowder. Um, steel is very, very strong. Um, those kinds of characteristics are what we're talking about for a characteristic property. Last thing we talked about was section three of the book, chemical changes versus physical changes. Chemical changes change the identity of an object. Physical changes don't. Burning is a chemical change. We set something on fire, you're actually changing its molecules. A chemical reaction is actually a chemical change, not a physical change. If you cut something, or you grind it up in small pieces, or you paint it, or you melt it, or you evaporate it, or you freeze it, that's a physical change. It does not change the molecular identity. How do you know if you throw two things together into a beaker, how do you know whether or not it's a chemical change? Fizzing, foaming, temperature change, odor change, smoke, color change. Those sorts of things indicate to you that a chemical reaction or a chemical change has taken place. Chemical reaction and chemical change mean the same thing.